Um, all right, Ephesians chapter three. Um, who's tithing off all the money you made through illegitimate gains through the Jake Paul, Mike Tyson fight today? Who's, who's tithing off all that today? Did you, guys, did you guys see that fight? Raise your hand if you saw the fight. Okay, um, come on, guys. All right, here we go. Uh, this is a Mike Tyson quote. We're gonna get into the Bible in a second. I know it's been a minute. We're gonna get into the Bible in a second. Ephesians chapter three, if you wanna turn there. But here's something Mike Tyson said that I think is so relatable to the series we're in. Because what's the name of the series that we're in right now? The voice is in my head, right? So this is what, 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 uh, what, what uh, Iron Mike said. He said, Jake believes his own lies. So he said. He said, you have to become delusional to believe something you are not. He says, he says, there's something about when, a, when, when somebody thinks they're the baddest, when they think they're the best, when they think they're unstoppable, that's, like a, that's delusional thinking, but it's the kind of thinking that changes kind of who you are because you begin to believe that about yourself. And for good or for bad, we believe what's in our head. And see, what God wants you to know is who you truly are. He wants you to know what we've been talking about over the last few weeks as we read through Ephesians, that you are chosen, that you're adopted. And today we're gonna to talk about something else that God says who you are, and this is issues of your identity, right? See, the enemy, he wants to tell you who you used to be. He wants to accuse you of being somebody else. But when you realize the secret, when you realize the truth of God about who you are, everything absolutely changes. But to believe that you're somebody that you're not, that's delusional thinking. Today, we need to come against the delusional thinking that is in our minds from the lies that have been placed there by the enemy. Today, we need to decide we're gonna believe what God says about us to be true and let that dictate our life and forge our identity. Did you come to church today because you wanna hear the truth of God? Do you believe the truth absolutely sets us free? Do you believe where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom? Come on, who the sun sets free is free. Today we need to just, it needs to be an assault. We need to take these lies out of our head and we need to replace them with the truth. Now, every time I point this microphone at you, I want you to say the word power. Let's practice, one, two, three. Power. Okay, now 40% uh, of this room said it and I want, uh, I, want, I want to really feel it in the room. We're gonna read the word of God, okay? If we're gonna try it again, I'm gonna read it and every time I point the mic at you, you say power, okay? Here we go, Ephesians chapter three. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will... Power. empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And many, and may you have the power, power to understand. You see that? It's back to our thoughts. May you have the power to understand um, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. It's like it takes supernatural help for us to understand God's love for us. Can I get a witness? He says this, then you will be made complete, all the fullness of life and power. power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we can ever ask or think. What is he saying there? He's saying not only are you chosen, not only are you adopted, or what we talked about last week, you're a masterpiece, but you are empowered. There is a sense of power that you must discover that is true to who you are because you are born again by the Spirit of God. You have the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And I know that if I were to survey this room and you're anything like me, you would not say that you feel powerful a lot of the times. You would say you feel what? Weak. We feel weak because we fall back into the same sin or we struggle with the same things or sometimes we want to make changes in our life and we, you know, we're not able to pull them off or sometimes we step out in faith and then we step back in coward. We, 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 we experience such weakness that we can begin to believe the lie that we are not powerful in Christ Jesus but whenever we read about who God says we are, he talks about how we're powerful. There is a sense of power that you do not know and I do not know that it comes, it, it comes at the revelation of God and there's, turn to the person next to, next to you and just say, there's levels to this stuff. Let them know. There's levels to this stuff. There's levels to this stuff. Ephesians 3, he's like, I want you to know the power in your mind. I want you to know the power of this. And then finally he just says, now all God's glory to who is able to do his mighty power. Now he's even saying there's power. Now he's even saying there's mighty power, right? There's levels to this stuff. And then he says, according to at work within us. 
There is a level of power that you and I need to know, and there's a lie that we believe that we're weak. And that lie often sounds like this. Well, I'm only human. Who said that one before? Well, I'm only human. Now, that might be a nice thing to say to somebody when they need to hear grace, right? Hey, man, you're only human, right? Sure. But does the Bible ever affirm that you are only human? Or does the Bible drill over and over and over again that you are set apart, that you are sanctified, that you are redeemed, you are filled with the Holy Spirit? He says the power that raised Christ from the grave lives in you. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. The Bible's not like, well, I'm only human. The Bible's like, you are a son or daughter of God. You're a son or daughter of the most high God. Well, I'm only human. No, you are born again. You are a new creation. So, I mean, this whole I'm only human thing, you know, let people who don't know the power of God say that. Let us be reminders of each other that Jesus was only human when he was on earth. No, he was human, but he was also the son of God. And that's what we're called to live. We're supposed to be human in our capabilities, but, but the son of God in our unlimited power that is at work and in us. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a great story about a woman who, in John chapter eight, who knew what it was like to feel weak. And I picked this story today because it's a very moving story that I think many people can, can relate to. Maybe, maybe it's a physical issue you're going through. Maybe it's a, a financial issue. Maybe it's just the worries of life that just kind of keep you kind of weak. Anybody in here struggling with worrying about too much things that you can't control? Anybody else, right? Uh, and, and we go to God and we're, we're asking for help and, and sometimes God doesn't come to our, our rescue in time, it feels like. Sometimes he's taking too long to answer our prayers, right? Sometimes it's like, it's like God, I need you, I need you. And, 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 and if we were God, we would jump in and fix the situation right away. But somehow God feels like it's in be our best interest to leave us there for a little while. Have you guys noticed this about the Lord? Well, somebody's waving me down like, that's me, that's me. Uh, the Apostle Paul went through this, and I want to read this before I get into the story of the woman, but he, says, he said this. He said three times, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take this thing away from me. You know, we don't know what it was. You know, we don't know what he was struggling with, but he's like, man, three different times I begged God. That's what it says in the New Living Translation. I begged God to take this away from me. I don't know what it was, but it was something that was ongoing in his life. There was a struggle that was making him feel weak, and he would go to God and he'd say, I need you to take this away from me. And God wouldn't answer his prayer. And then he would go and say, I need you to take this away from me. And he wouldn't get any answer. But the third time he went to the Lord and he's like, God, I need you to deliver me. I need you to help me here. Change the circumstances because I'm so weak. I need you to change the circumstances. This is what he said. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. He says, no, 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 I'm not trying to change the circumstances. I'm trying to change you. There is a power that is available in you to overcome these things. And if I deliver or change the circumstances, you miss the opportunity to recognize, watch this, how weak you are and the opportunity to surrender that to me because my power is made perfect in weakness. This changed Paul's life because he realized that being weak wasn't the problem. It's not being able to surrender to God that is the problem. He says, no, no, no. I go on to say, uh, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. He's like, I'm a different man now. Now I realize that weaknesses is something that I, I can boast about, you know? I, I, I realize there's something here when you discover weakness. He says, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Sorry, I took your line. So that Christ's power, power can rest on me. On me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, he says, and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Turn to the person next to you. First point power comes from surrendering your weakness to God. Power comes from surrendering your weakness to God. Power comes from surrendering your weakness to God. What does it mean to realize that you're weak? And then see that as an opportunity to delight in that, to celebrate that. Because uh, like, 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 like my favorite, you know, modern day theologian, Mike Tyson says, uh, <laughs> it's delusional to think that you're somebody that you're not. The Bible doesn't say that you're not weak. The Bible just says you're filled with God's power. Are you guys, you understand that? Being made perfect in God's power is about surrendering to God. 
And the closer, you, the better you get at surrendering to God in your weak times, that's when he's able to change you. And there's a woman here I want to read this story about. And I'll give you a little context. It's in Luke chapter 8. She's a woman who knew a weakness really well. She, uh, the Bible says that she uh, had an issue of continuous flowing of blood for 12 years. Raise your hand if you've heard this story before. And um, I've studied this so many times, and there's a lot of details that aren't in here, and a lot of people fill in a lot of gaps, and they, they make a lot of assumptions, and I don't want to do that today. I just wanted to start with this. There's a woman who's been struggling with something for 12 years. Is that fair to say? Now, what's interesting about her challenge here, it, 12 years of struggling as a woman, is number one, uh, any time you had an issue of blood, whatever that is, the Old Testament law says if you have exposed blood, you're not supposed to engage with people socially because of the risk of infection. That law was written to people thousands of years, that was written to people who didn't understand infection, right? And so God was very clear in his protective laws about health. And once, you're, once the blood was gone, and, you, know, you would go to a priest and he would, he would announce that you're clean. And then you could go back into society. But this even, as bizarre as this sounds, had to do with a woman on her menstrual cycle. And some people would believe that maybe she just had a never-ending menstrual cycle. Or maybe it was an injury that, that never healed. Or we don't know what it was. It was an issue of blood, and it just never went away. And for 12 years, she struggled with this illness. And so for 12 years, if she ever wanted to go into public, there were protocols that she had to follow where she would have to actually announce to people around her that she was unclean. If she went into a public square, like let's say she was going to the marketplace to buy food, she would have to tell people in the crowd, unclean, unclean, unclean. And they would get out of the way because if they were to touch her, they felt they could be physically you know, uh, contaminated or they felt like they could be spiritually infected. And then they would have to go through their own spiritual ritual, right? So she had to declare about herself that she was unclean for 12 years. The first thing she told someone about herself was that she was unclean. Can you imagine what that would do to your self-image? Can you imagine your self-worth, that that's your number one primary identity marker over and over and over again? Not to mention the reality that when you were in constant illness or when you had something going on like this that made you unclean, people would assume that you were cursed by God. People would assume that God was doing this to you. Right? I know you never have those thoughts. Things aren't going your way. And you're like, no, that's the Lord. That's, that's him. That's because of what I was doing last night. That's because of, you know. But this is something that she was battling constantly. And other people were affirming this lie. And so this is kind of her identity. Now, uh, she, she, she hears that Jesus is coming to her city and his reputation has preceded him. She knows he's a miracle worker. And so she's like, I wanna get to Jesus and I want, to, uh, I, I want him to heal me. But the problem is, is if she were to go to Jesus and she were to touch him, right? She would be risking making a rabbi unclean. So it was a real, it was a real courageous thing if she was to actually even go to Jesus. Well, it's not like she could go to church because if Jesus was speaking at a synagogue, she wasn't allowed in the synagogue because of her child. So you see the conundrum that she's in. She's trapped. So for 12 years, she hasn't been in church. She hasn't been engage, able to engage socially. How, has she been able to get married or have kids? No. And at 12 years, you know, think about this. She could be as old as her 20s, right, that she's had this going on. And so she's really treated as somebody who is, you know, if you didn't have kids in that era, you, you, it was a whole different level of shame that was on you. You read lots of Bible stories about women dealing with the shame of not being able to have kids. We don't believe that today, but that was something that their, her identity is I'm, I'm broken. Her identity is I'm unclean. Nobody wants me. Uh, people don't want me around because I'm, I, I, I get them infected. And so she just had this, just, this, this, she just wore this every day of her life. And, and Jesus comes to town, and she's like, I want to go see Jesus. But something happens. She chickens out. She doesn't go. And I don't know why she didn't go. And I was talking to my wife about this, and she said, you know, uh, years ago, you know, Maria went through some pretty bad health issues, and she had to have multiple blood transfusions. And she told me, she said, you know, I remember crawling to the bathroom. Like, I remember being not, having issues of blood makes you so weak. And she's like, maybe she was just too weak to even get to Jesus that day. I'm like, that could be what it is. 
Or maybe there was the lies in her head saying, Nobody, you know, you don't want to get Jesus unclean. Or, or maybe it was the shame of what people were saying about her. I don't know, but Jesus came to town. The miracle worker was there and she didn't go. And, and, and that was her shot. So she spent all her money and she, she couldn't get healed. And, 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 and I can't even imagine how, how, how demoralized she was at that point. Her one shot comes to her. And so Jesus, he leaves town and it says he gets in a boat and he goes across the sea of Galilee there and he goes to another region. And when he's in this region, he encounters a man who has uh, not one, not two, but 2,000 demons in him. Have you guys ever read the story about the guy with a legion of demons, right? And so this guy comes and falls at Jesus' feet and there's this really powerful encounter where you see how much more powerful, come on, say power. power. Jesus is over these demons. He casts all the demons out. You guys remember where they go? Where does he say the demons? Yeah, into the pigs. It's wild. And, and so all these pigs go running off a cliff. And then how do you, feel, how do you think the farmers felt about all their pigs jumping off a cliff, right? <laughs> it's like, we know, you don't eat, we know you only eat kosher, but that's a little much. Like that's, you, that was a lot of bacon that you just, you know. Uh, what, what did they do? They said, they said, you are too powerful. You are too scary, okay? The scariest dude in our city uh, was just subdued by your words. Um, you must leave. So they kick Jesus out of this region because he's too scary, powerful, yeah. And so Jesus gets back in the boat, doesn't stay the night, and he starts heading where? Back to that town where the girl is, right? Where this woman is. So now as he's coming back across, word gets out, and now everybody's freaking out. Now everybody who got a miracle the first time Jesus is there has brought their friends. So everybody and their grandma is on the shore waiting for Jesus to pull up. The Bible says there's so many people that when Jesus tries to get out of the boat, that they are thronging on, like they, they, are, they, are, they are surrounding Jesus, and the Bible says they are pressing on Jesus. And the disciples have now become um, uh, bodyguards, and they are trying to keep people off Jesus. Everybody wants to touch him. And you just get this picture of them slowly trying to move to this guy, you know, to Jesus' next appointment, which is actually pretty important. It's a 12-year-old girl who is about to die, and that's, they're going to his house, okay? So I've kind of summarized the whole thing. But I want you to picture the second chance for this woman to come. And she's like, do you know what? I, I, I gotta be there. I gotta be there this time. So I don't know if she was so sick the first time that she didn't have the energy, or I don't know if she had to just fight off those lies or what, but she says, Jesus is here a second time. I'm not gonna miss my miracle this time. So she says, so, so she starts going toward Jesus, and it says, a woman, verse uh, 43, and the crown had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the blood stopped. Now, there's a lot of theories about this, about uh, touching the fringe of his robe, because it is interesting that she didn't touch his shoulder. It's interesting that, you know, she didn't grab his hand. Why is she coming up behind him and touching the fringe of his robe? Well, Jesus would have been wearing a, 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 a cloak of sorts that rabbis wear, and on the bottom there were these tassels. And uh, those tassels actually, actually represented the law of God. Each one of those tassels had a meaning. And so common, uh, you know, theologians and people much smarter than myself are like, which one of the tassels did she grab? You know, like that's the magic tassel or something like that, right? Because that one could represent a certain, you know, who knows? And then somebody goes, well, what was happening here is in the Old Testament, you know, the book of Malachi talks about how the wings of an eagle from the Messiah and the word wing and the word tassel is the same word in Hebrew. And so when she grabbed the tassel, she was grabbing the wing, which is the corner, which means that she was pronouncing that he was the Messiah. And I'm like, you guys are really, you guys are really connecting a lot of dots here. You're really connecting a lot of dots here. And I just think the Bible is not that complicated. And I don't think God ever intended faith to be complicated. I think, can I just give you my just simple man's theory here? I think the reason why she came up behind him and grabbed the hem of his garment, is it too much to assume that maybe with all those people pressing in and her physical weakness and her fear of what other people thought, is it too much to assume that maybe the reason why she didn't grab his hand or his shoulder and she came up behind him and she grabbed the bottom of his robe, do you think maybe because she was crawling you think maybe she was crawling toward him? Maybe she didn't have the energy to get through people and she fell to the ground and she, in her last, you know, in a desperate attempt, she reached out and she just maybe grabbed the hem of his robe. 
See, when I read this story, I'm not, I'm not looking at a woman who is connecting the dots between the Torah and the Messiah. I think this is a desperate woman who's just trying to get the only hope that she has left. She's tried everything, and she just thought to herself, if I could just get to Jesus. What's that called when you've tried everything and you give everything you have? What's that called? What's that called? It's called desperation. And what does that look like when you go to Jesus with your desperation? It's called faith. And what happens here is that she brings all of who she is to Jesus, and she reaches out as desperate as she is, and something happens when she grabs the hem of that garment. And I don't think it was the garment or the tassel is what made it special. I think it was her faith. I think it was that sense of like, I'm weak and he's strong. And if I could just connect the two. It says that when she grabs him, Jesus does something so wild. He does a miracle that he didn't plan on doing. It says that he wasn't, this miracle caught him by surprise. And he doesn't even know the person who got healed when this happens. This is the only miracle I know that catches Jesus by surprise. <laughs> but that's how powerful her faith was in that moment. That's how powerful the faith of a desperate person is when they encounter God. When somebody who just knows they're weak and knows they need a savior and they can't save themselves. Anybody experienced that kind of power in your life? Has anybody experienced that kind of power? And so she comes to Jesus and she says, immediately the bleeding stopped. And then Jesus says, who touched me? Did you imagine all those people there pressing around Jesus, you know? It says that they were thronging him, right? Who touched me, Jesus asked. And everyone denied it. And Peter said, master, the whole crowd <laughs> is pressing against you. Master, with all due respect, we're just trying to get you from point A to point B, and there's a million people around, and like, we don't have time to figure out who the one person in the crowd that touched you is. And Jesus goes, no, 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 Peter, you don't get it. While you were so concentrated on the physical, you missed what happened in the spiritual. And he says this, power has gone out from me. That word in Greek, power, is the word dunamis. It's also pronounced in a different dialect, thinamis. Okay? I don't know if we can put the word on the screen, but when you look at this word and you see, it's, you see, you see when it's pronounced, you see what, what word's next to it? What word do we get from thinamus or dunamis? What word do we get? Dynamite. <laughs> he says, Peter, I don't, I don't know if you're just so concentrated on all the physical people, you know, and the mosh pit. <laughs> but, um, dude, a, a bomb just went off in the spiritual realm. Someone just lit a fuse. There was an explosion in the spiritual realm. And I don't know who lit the fuse, but I felt the explosion. Dunamis power has left me. He's the, the creator, Jesus, by the way, not a man who became God. Who is Jesus? He's the God who became man. He's the God who spoke all of creation into existence. That power, that, be, that person, power has left him and gone into this woman. And because Jesus was only human, and he was limited because he was human in his understanding of everything that was going on, he had chosen to limit himself, it says in, in Philippians 2, to being human, but he was still the son of God, right? He did not know in that moment. Are there times when Jesus knows? Yeah, it says that he knows their thoughts all the time. He's reading people's thoughts. He knows what's going on. There are times, just like you and I, sometimes we're led by the Spirit in ways that are supernatural, and some days, some days it's just a Tuesday, right? Same thing. It says at one point, the power of God was on Jesus to heal at that moment. So we see that like Jesus is, goes through the same thing that we do, which is the struggle of I'm only human, but I'm also a son and daughter of God, right? Jesus lived that same challenge, and he was in that moment where he goes, <laughs> power has left God, but my thinking of a man doesn't know who it is. And so what does he do? He stops. He stops. And they're like, come on, Jesus, we got to get to this guy's house. There's a girl, her life is on the line, right? And then Jesus is like, yeah, I should probably hurry, huh? It's like, no, stop. Stop. I'm not going anywhere. So I found out who's touched me. 
Yeah, Jesus doesn't do random miracles. Jesus doesn't do impersonal miracles. He goes, I want to know who it was. I want to know where that faith came from. I want to know their name. I want to look them in the eye. Anybody grateful for a personal savior? He wasn't too much in a hurry to get to the next miracle because he had to stop right where he was and say no. And then the Bible says that he keeps asking, who was it, who was it? As if Jesus is being stubborn. I'm not going anywhere until I find out who this was. But why didn't the girl want to reveal herself? Because she was afraid. And why? Why was this lady afraid? Because she, she thought maybe she rubbed off on Jesus and made him unclean. But anybody grateful that when our weakness rubs off on God, he doesn't get weak, but his power rubs off on us and fills us with the Holy Spirit? How amazing. She's over here thinking maybe she did something to him. And he's like, no, I want to talk about what just happened to you. Dynamite has gone off. I felt it. The power of God. Because of your faith. Who was it? And he's over here. Who was it? Who was it? And the disciples are like, all right, who was it? Who was it? And the Bible says she was hiding. Look at this. Everyone denied it. The crowd's suppressing it. But Jesus says, no, somebody deliberately touched me. I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, <laughs> when she realized Jesus wasn't just going to move on, that he was waiting for her. Man, anybody grateful for a God like this? I just love this part of the story. Jesus is like, nah, we're waiting. I'm not going to let her hide in fear. I love this. She comes out. She began to tremble. So she's shaking. She fell at her knees in front of him. And the whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. And then Jesus does something he doesn't do anywhere else in the whole Bible. He says something he never says to anybody else. He looks at her and he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. This is the only time that Jesus ever calls anybody daughter. And I just, I think it's so powerful because this is a woman who her whole last 12 years, she's been saying, I'm unclean. And she's been telling herself, and she's been letting what other people say define who she is. And Jesus goes, I'm not going to take another step until I tell her who she really is. You're my daughter. Amen. And you see, Jesus doesn't take time explaining that she's not unclean anymore or why she shouldn't listen to those lies. He just announces over her who she is. And some of us, we get so caught up in our weakness we try, to, we try to figure this all out. And we just, we just need to go to the simple words of Jesus. That though you may feel weak, you are filled with the power of God. Though you may feel like an outcast, you are welcome in God's family. Though you may feel like a reject, you are chosen by God. Though you may feel like you're weak, in Him you are strong. Oh, I'm only human. I don't, I just, I don't like that saying anymore, guys. Can we not say that anymore? I'm only human. I feel like it's disrespectful. You're not only human. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Jesus looks at her and he says, let me tell you who you are. You've been, everybody, including yourself, you've had this voice in your head. Put my voice in your head. You are my daughter. She hadn't heard that in her. 12 years. I'll end with this story, and I hope it helps somebody. But um, as we talk about surrendering our weakness to God, I want you just to think for a second, what are the areas that I'm not going to deny that I'm weak, but I'm going to recognize that I'm weak, and I'm going to surrender them to God? Because here's the third point for you guys. I don't know how many points I did today, but this is one of them. <laughs> the level that you're willing to surrender to God, that's equal to the level of power of God that's available for you. Okay, so, so when you recognize that you're weak and you give to God, that, that's more of an opportunity for God's power. Don't lie to yourself and say you're not weak. Admit that you need God and receive his grace for your life, right? If you don't think you need God's grace, you're not gonna find it. That's pride. But humility says, God, I need more of you, right? And I was driving uh, years ago, I believe it was 2014, and I was driving I just gotten off the freeway. I remember right where I was. You guys ever have those moments where you have an encounter with God? You remember right where you were? I'm driving and I'm talking to my friend and I, was ha I, I had a little, I had a little, uh, I, I, one, I believe I had one kid at the time when they were little. You guys ever have one kid and it's just really exhausting? You guys ever have one kid? Yeah? 
People come to me all the time. I'm like, oh man, I'm so tired from my one kid. Bless your hearts. Bless your hearts, you and your one child. But I was so tired <laughs> and I'm driving and, uh, and I'm on my way home and I'm just trying to get home and I'm talking to my buddy and I'm like, man, it's been a heck of a day, dude. I, man, and I gotta go home, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. And I said, I need a drink. That's what I said. I need a drink. And uh, I wasn't somebody who struggled with drinking a lot of alcohol, just an occasional drinker, you know? I didn't even keep alcohol in my refrigerator at home. Just sometimes I was like, man, I'm gonna stop by on the way home and I'm gonna get a, you know, get a six pack or whatever it is. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna have a drink when I get home. And I, but these words were, I need a drink. You know what I mean? You ever heard that song, uh, Jesus Take the Wheel? I feel like Jesus almost just pulled me off the side of the road right there, dude. <laughs> Holy Spirit had a little powwow with me. He's like, oh, that's what you need, huh? That's what you need, son? You need a drink? <laughs> that's gonna give you the rest that you're looking for? That's gonna satisfy you? That's gonna give you the peace that you need right now? Oh, that, 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 that power that you need to go home and be the husband and the father that you've been called to be, what you need is a drink for that? I'm embarrassed to tell this story, but who in here has actually said things like that before? And I'm not anti-drinking. Some of the other day goes, you know, I don't drink alcohol because I'm a Christian. And I was like, oh, really? Because you know, Jesus drank alcohol. So I didn't know that you were more religious than Jesus. <laughs> this is not an anti-alcohol talk. This is once upon a time, I said these words, I need this instead of my savior. And I don't know what your weakness was, but man, am I glad the Holy Spirit caught me right where I was. Cause you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit gives us a hug, but sometimes the Holy Spirit gives us a headlock. And he was like, son, this is not gonna be a pattern in your life. When you feel weak, you're not gonna run to having a drink. When you feel weak, you're gonna run to me. Jesus says, come to me all you are weary and heavy laden and take my yoke upon me. It is easy, it is light. I can give you rest that is good for your soul. He said, young man, this is not going to be a pattern for you. When you're weak, you are gonna to run to me. What does Paul say? In my weakness, I am strong. What did God say? My power is made perfect in weakness. And I, I decided, you know what? I'm gonna just fast from drinking alcohol. I know that sounds weird. I'd never heard anybody say that, but I was reading, um, I was reading about John the Baptist. I'll never forget it. And it said that John the Baptist experienced the Holy Spirit in a way that nobody else had. And it said that he didn't drink any alcohol. And I thought, Lord, is there a connection here between the fast, because John the Baptist was, took a vow to not drink alcohol, the fast to not drink alcohol, does that mean that because he didn't do that, that he was able to know more of your Holy Spirit because he gave something up? See, a lot of times we say, God, uh, I need more of you. And God would look at you and say, you don't need more of me. I need more of you. It's like, oh, I, I, if I could only have more of God, right? The, the, the answer isn't, you, 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 can you have more of God? What does he say in Ephesians 3? You can't handle more of God. The question is not God, do I have all of you? The question is God, do you have all of me? That's what weakness says. There was something there that God didn't have of me. You see this? Say, I don't know what your weakness is. Maybe your weakness is your finances. Maybe when you're stressed out, you put money on a credit card. That's an area of weakness that you could give to God. I fast alcohol. I don't drink alcohol anymore I, on a fast. Last night, I was at a friend's house and they kept trying to put a drink in my hand. And I'm like, look, I don't wanna explain this, but like, you know, I, I'm fasting alcohol. How long have you been fasting alcohol? Well, like 12 years, but I just, I don't, I don't want it. Are you with me on this? Maybe you need to fast a credit card. Are you with me? I'm not saying credit cards are wrong, but credit cards are definitely wrong for some people. Maybe you're so weak, you need to give that to God. Or maybe, maybe it's dating. Who? Maybe it's dating apps. Maybe you need to fast dating and delete some apps off your phone and say, God, I've been weak in this area and I'm gonna surrender this to you. Is that fair to say? 
Some of us, our weakness in our finance or our weakness in, our, in dating, there's areas of our life that not necessarily sinful, right? It wasn't sinful for me to have a drink that night, but it wasn't God's best for my life. And when I see that it's a weakness, I can now delight because I see an opportunity for another level of God's power. His grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in weakness. And I wonder if today we could be real with ourselves, like this woman was real so many years ago about her desperation for God. Come on, will you stand to your feet? If you're desperate for more of God in your life, would you ask him to show you where you're weak? Some of you, you know right away where you're weak. Some of you know right away. Some of you gotta take a second. And as you think of what you are weak in and you wanna give it to God, I want you to lift your hands to him. Maybe some of you, it's like, I shouldn't be drinking anymore. Maybe some of you need to cut some credit cards up. Maybe some of you need to delete an app or two. I don't know where your weakness is, but come on, let's lift our hands to heaven and give our weakness to God so we can surrender to his power. No turning back, no turning back. And I've decided to follow Jesus. And I've decided to give my own. And all with this, 1 Corinthians 1.18. Get ready to say your line, okay? The message of the cross. What's the message of the cross? Salvation, right? The message of the cross is that somebody had to answer for all the sins of all the sinners. We either stand before God and we get what's coming to us because of our sin, or we stand before God and Jesus says, hey, Father, I did that for them so that they don't have to answer. I answered so they don't have to answer. That's the message of the cross, okay? The message of the cross is the plan of salvation. The message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Would you bow your head, would you close your eyes? This is not a church that focuses on helping you become a good person. This is a church that helps you focus on Jesus so that you can become who he's always intended you to be. This is not a message of how you can go from being a good person to a better person. The cross is about how we could be go, from, go from being dead to being alive. Morality is a tricky thing. It makes you feel better because, oh, I'm a good person now. I feel better about myself. But the truth is, is you'll never be good enough. You're never gonna be good enough. And that's what Jesus shows us. But what he gives us is his goodness. He will give you a fresh start by forgiving you of all the wrong things you've done. And he will give you the Holy Spirit, his spirit, the power, to help you overcome all the new challenges, but he also gives you a new identity. You are born again because you need a new identity. He's not interested in cleaning up the old person. He's interested in letting the old person die so the new one can live in him. And if you wanna be alive in Christ, forgiven of what you've done, filled with this power that we've been talking about today, and you're ready to live a new life, it starts with saying, I need a savior. I can't save myself. I need a savior. And if you're willing to put your faith in Jesus, I believe today will be your day of salvation. Is that anybody here today? Would you raise your hand if you're saying today, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to say yes to Jesus. I see you two in the front row right here. I see you in the front row. I see you in the back over there. I'm looking, I see your hand. I see your hand back there. And I see your hand waving me down. And I see you, sir. 
and one, two, three, four. I see all you guys, and I see you, and you right here, yep. Anybody back here? I see you back there. I see all you guys, I see all you guys back there. I see you waving me down. I see your hand and your hand. And your, yeah, and I see your hand. Come on, anybody, anybody desperate for Jesus, grateful that he's a personal savior. Anybody grateful that in our time of need, he's been there for us. Anybody experiencing a before and after story because of the goodness of God. If he's been good to you, can you make some noise? If he's been faithful, can you make some noise? If you know what it's like to experience the power of God in your weakest moment, if you can delight in your weakness because of how good he is. Amazing. Why don't we just pray this prayer together before we dismiss. Can we say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Will you help me this week? Acknowledge my weakness and surrender it to you so I can live a powerful life that demands an explanation about how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.